Hello everyone, Sean Mullery is my name and I'm a lecturer in electronic engineering from IT Sligo. I'm going to describe to you in this video the basic introduction to the Embedded Programming 201 subject. Now, the three things that I'm going to tell you about in this is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the syllabus for the subject. I'm going to tell you about assessment and marking and so how the, the subject is going to be assessed and marked. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the thing called the flipped classroom model, which is probably about the best description I can use to describe how the subject is actually going to be delivered. So to start off with the C pro or the embedded programming syllabus, we're going to be doing some C programming for hardware. So this is different from uh, doing standard C programming for the desktop PC. We're going to be doing it for specific pieces of embedded hardware, and that's what separates us from the the ordinary C programmer. And this means that we're going to have limited resources. Um, now, the PC has limited resources too, but nowhere near as limited as most embedded systems. And what we're going to have to take into account when we're programming these embedded systems is just how limited those resources are. So we're going to have to know how limited they are before we can write our program. The other thing though that we want to do is we don't, while, while we may concentrate on one particular piece of hardware um, from time to time, we don't want to only consider one piece of hardware. We want to write our software in such a way that it is portable. And that means that we can take our piece of software and we can move it or port it as the term is, is used to another piece of hardware. And we want to do that with, as, with the minimum of changes that we can. So you try to design your program so that, uh, your computer program, so that you have the limited or small changes to make in order to move it to another piece of hardware. C is very good for doing that, but there will always be small changes that you have to make. And the way you design your program is very important to the amount of changes that you have to make. Now I'm just gonna quickly move to, um, this is the syllabus document uh, which you can download off the IT Sligo uh, website. Um, I'll also put it up in Moodle, uh, the Moodle subject for this so that you can see it there. That's probably the easiest way to get it. And there are a few things that I just want to point out in this. And the first thing here uh, that I want to mention to you is the learning outcomes. Now the learning outcomes are basically at the end of the program, they're a description of what we would like you, the learner, to have achieved, what you should be able to do. Okay, so we all start the sentences on completion of this model, the learner will or should be able to differentiate between C for microcontrollers and C for desktop computers. So most of you will have done some C already for a desktop computer. Now you're doing some C for a microcontroller. You need to know what the differences are and how we handle um, C programming for a microcontroller. We also want you to be able to develop programs to access hardware on a microcontroller. So that might be uh, input output ports or a serial port or whatever it may be. And you'll see that as we go through the, uh, the, the course. We also want you to be able to develop interrupt service routines for event driven programs. So this is one of the things that you, you wouldn't have really seen uh, if you did desktop programming, which is the interrupt service routine, which is something that happens um, upon uh, a user input. In other words, if uh, a user presses a button, for example, that it interrupts your program and immediately goes to service that and deal with that. And we'll be going into that in much more detail later in the course. You need, or we want the student again at the end of this module to appreciate the resource constraints of an embedded system, to understand that there is only limited resources, only a certain amount of memory, a certain clock speed, a certain number of interrupts and timers and things like that, so that you're aware of that and you write your program to deal with that. And finally, uh, in the learning outcomes here, we want um, this, the learner to be able to determine the correct code to interface with specific hardware external to the microcontroller. So um, it's not just the microcontroller itself, but we can actually you know, attach up a seven segment display or a liquid crystal display or a motor. So any sort of um, uh, an input device or an actuator or a sensor, we, we want you to know how you would write code to interface to that, okay? Now, there is also an indicative syllabus, and the word indicative suggests that we can, we can play around with this a little bit, but this will be generally what we'll be covering in the course. We'll be looking at cross compilers, debuggers, emulators, and simulators. Again, don't worry if you don't know what they mean. That's the whole point of this course is to cover those. We'll um, be looking at the specific differences between microcontroller C and desktop C, as we mentioned. 
We'll be reading and writing to ports. Uh, we'll be looking at interrupt service routines. We'll be looking at external interrupts, uh, such as uh, an interrupt that can come from outside the microcontroller. We'll also be looking at hardware timers, and again, they're linked to interrupts, but they're uh, internal to the microcontroller. We're looking at serial port and other communication mechanisms within the microcontroller and how to write C programs for that. And we'll be looking at resource issues, uh, such as how much memory you have. We'll be looking at lookup tables. Um, and we'll be looking at integers versus floating points, uh, the types of variables that you use, and so on. And how do I get onto my next sheet here? I just want to make that a little larger. Okay, now I'll come back to this in a moment because uh, in here we're going to look at some of the assessment techniques, but that's the next uh, slide that I want to look at. So back to my PowerPoint um, presentation. We want to look at assessment and marking. So for this subject, it's a 100% continuous assessment subject. So there is no final written paper as there would be in some of your other subjects. Um, the standard exercises do not carry marks. So I'm going to be getting you to do exercises. I'll explain that in a moment. But those standard exercises, even though you upload them, they don't actually carry marks. They're useful to you uh, as part of the learning experience. And they're also useful to you later on when you do your open book practical exam. So that's the next thing. You will be given at least two open book practical assessments that carry 25% of the marks in each case. Now, they are open book, so that means that you can have access to all of your notes, all of the previous exercises and programs that you've written, any textbook that you want. You can access the internet and look up material there. You can look up the help menus. You can look up any data documents. The only thing you can't do in those practical assessments is you can't talk to the other students. Um, you can't use any telecommunications device. So you can't use email. You can't use your phone and so on. You're working on your own, but you can look up the internet and look up all that sort of material in order to uh, help you with those exercises. Um, and that is why it is so important to do the standard exercises that we see mentioned there, because if you haven't done those and you don't have those ready for your practical assessment, um, you, won't, uh, you, you won't be able to do the practical assessment quick enough or you won't know how to do it. There will also be 25% of the marks going for Moodle quizzes. Um, so there will be a certain amount of the Moodle quizzes that we, we may do just as what we call formative assessment. In other words, just to uh, to see, to have, have you understood all the material that we're doing. But there will also be a summative assessment, which is uh, we'll use the quizzes that will actually, um, we will mark you on those and actually give you, you, you uh, credit for that towards your final score. So we'll make you aware of which it is in each case. So some of the quizzes um, are, are literally used as a learning experience. Other quizzes are used to as properly assess you to see uh, what you know and give you marks for that. There'll be a final 25% of the marks will be given um, for uh, one or more special assignments. So as I said, the standard assignments don't carry marks, but there will be special assignments there um, one or more of the <coughs> of those um, which we will uh, which we will give you marks for and that will be the final 25% of the marks uh, just to go back to the document here you can see where this is all included in here so there's the the practical exercises there there's no marks for going for them and they're ongoing every week um, however you can see there that we have the practical exam there 25% uh, of the marks we have week five written in there, but it may not happen on week five. If the, it's just to give us an idea of roughly where we want to do it. Um, we have another practical exam then roughly around week nine, and we'll probably give you a practical exercise uh, that that last assignment, as I mentioned, coming towards the very end so that you, you pull together everything that you, you've done up to that point. Multiple choice quizzes, the Moodle quizzes, they will be ongoing throughout the course and they will make up the final 25% of the marks. Okay. Uh, the other thing just to mention to you is that uh, you'll have, uh, this is for the full-time students, um, there's four hours of laboratory uh, of this per week. Uh, for the online students, you have, you have the one hour online lab and the rest you do in your own time. So um, slightly different depending on uh, which, uh, which version of the course that you're taking. Now, just to finally to explain the flipped classroom model and anybody that has done the C programming uh, course with me previously, uh, you'll be familiar with this model, but for those who don't, this is their, your first introduction to it. 
The subject is taught by short videos, just like the one you're watching now. Hopefully, which I try and keep them between about five and 10 minutes, but they naturally become a little bit longer um, as the, the exercise and so on that we're showing become that bit more complicated. You can watch these as often as you want, so you can rewind a little bit, watch it again, or, or watch the whole thing again if you haven't fully understood everything. Um, you'll then be asked to attempt exercises and quizzes in the laboratory or in your own time. And these exercises will get increasingly more difficult. Okay, so you start with easy exercises and they get harder and harder as time goes on. Very important, the videos do not contain all the knowledge to complete the exercises. So you will get an ex you will get some exercises where um, I won't have explained in the video how to do that exercise and it's up to you to then try to uh, solve that exercise. So to do that, You'll need to gain knowledge um, and you sh to do that you can look up the internet, you can look up the help menus, you can look up textbooks, but you can also discuss with your classmates or as a final option you can ask your tutor, be that myself or one of the other tutors that will be teaching this subject. Um, as far as possible, while, while uh, myself and the other tutors will be very happy to answer questions or to help you out. Um, we would prefer if you tried to solve the problem first yourself before you ask your tutor for, for assistance or for the answer. And in fact, your tutor will probably check to see have you tried yourself before they will answer your question. They may point you in the right direction but not maybe answer your question until they've seen that you've made an attempt. This is very important because uh, you can't really become proficient at this sort of material unless you're solving problems yourself. Um, because your tutor will not always be there with you. So when you go out in the workplace and you're asked to do um, some project, there will not always be somebody there who will have the answer. So it's very important that while you're in college, you start to learn that skill of figuring things out for yourself and only when you get into trouble trying to get the help from your tutor. Okay, so as far as possible, try to solve the problem yourself. Next best to that is to talk to one of your classmates and after that, talk to your tutor uh, and they will of course help you out okay so uh, that's all I want to cover in this particular video I hope that's given you uh, a good idea of uh, how the subject is going to be carried out and all the details to do with the marking